next, first up on the uh, LACM stage today is Alan Yates. He's going to be talking about VR stuff. Alan is a multidisciplinary engineer from uh, Seattle, originally from Sydney, and uh, works for Valve. He's uh, got a start in software and telecom, doing some, uh, some servers tied stuff, and now he is one of the finest hardware hackers that I know. Please welcome Alan to the stage. Wow, thanks for that, uh, that intro. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Alan Yates. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today, actually. Uh, for the past uh, four or five years, uh, I've been uh, working at Valve Corporation in uh, Seattle. We uh, do essentially VR there, and um, I'm going to talk to you today about the small part of um, the VR story that, that I did. So, VR requires a tracking tech. Um, You've got to put the correct vision into a person's eyes or else you're going to make them sick. That turns out to be a pretty technically difficult problem. When I first came to Valve, I started looking at all the possible ways that you could track in general. Um, and I actually invented the Lighthouse tracking technology quite early in the piece. And I was very worried that it would be almost impossible to implement. So I sat on the idea for months and months. And in the meantime, we developed a, a bunch, like four other different tracking techs, and they all had their own little problems. So Lighthouse started to look more and more you know, interesting and something that we could actually possibly do. So this is really a lot of the engineering details and the war stories about what we actually had to do to get it to work. OK, so an overview for people who've never heard about Lighthouse before. If you've used the HTC Vive VR system, you've used Lighthouse. Lighthouse is an optical navigation system. It, uh, it uses laser beams, blinking LEDs, photodiodes, and mathematics to work out where you are. Basically, um, you have these beacons in the world. The beacons emit some kind of modulated radiation. In, in the case of, of, of this system, it's light. Um, anyone who can see that light can sort of sit there, time it with their own clock, and work out where they are. It's fundamentally a triangulating system, so it measures angles. It doesn't measure distance. And the real trick to making it work is that measuring angles is a very technically challenging problem. So instead, we measure time. We, we convert an angle problem into a time problem. OK, so this is kind of the marketing part of, of Lighthouse, what's cool about it. Um, Lighthouse is extremely scalable. Because it's a broadcast system, everyone can use it who can see the light, as I, as I said previously. Um, the volume's very extensible. You can add more beacons. Um, and Working out where you are based on what you see is computationally cheap, both in terms of MIPS and in terms of the amount of watts that your system might actually need. There's, uh, there's no centralization. So you know, there's no authoritative system where you have to go and talk to to get information or log on to or anything like that. So you don't have any speed of light problems. You just look out into the world, work out where you are. This also makes it extremely private. Uh, I mean, that's not always a, a big issue, but for many people it is. You get the information, it flows directly from the beacon to the user of the system. They look at it, do their own calculations, and it's then up to them completely whether or not they want to share that information. It uh, also happens to be quite high performance. I mean, it was designed with VR in mind, so VR is an extremely challenging indoor positioning problem. But again, all the things I spoke about before, it's got a very large volume support. Uh, it can do extremely high resolution. It's very low latency, so pretty much as soon as you've looked at the light for a little while, you can instantly you know, just do a little bit of math and you've got your position and orientation. And it can do very fast updates, particularly if you fuse the information that you get from the optical system with a local inertial system. OK, so this is essentially the entry level basic requirement for a lighthouse system. You have the beacons. We call them base stations. Um, they emit light on the things that we call tracked objects, which is basically any user of the system. You have a bunch of sensors. Those sensors are, are essentially just photodiodes. They look out into the world and they see the light from the base stations. They do some math using some processing, and they can work out where they are. Optionally, we also have this uh, IMU. <laughs> you didn't think I wouldn't come with a laser, right? Um, so we have the IMU. That's an optional part of the system. Technically not Lighthouse, but in order to make a high-performance system like the one you need for VR, you probably need an inertial system to smooth out between the optical updates. So we have to talk a little bit about sensor fusion. Um, sensor fusion is a huge, huge topic, and we could talk probably for two months about it and still you know, not be up to the state of the art. But really, the, the thing that, that kind of matters is 
the optical system is absolute in the sense that it's relative to the real world. I mean, nothing is truly absolute. We could talk about you know, Newton's bucket argument and the equivalence problem and a whole bunch of physics, but inertial data is all relative. So accelerometers give you, you know, they give you acceleration. Gyroscopes give you rotational rates. In order to turn that into a position or, or anything to do with position, you have to integrate it. But when you integrate it, there's noise. And if you keep integrating noisy things, eventually the, the result will just drift off somewhere. So that's the reason why we can't just do it with an accelerometer or a gyro. Otherwise, you know, your phone or anything else would be a perfect platform for VR by itself. So what the optical system does is it gives you these periodic updates that are very close to what the real, you know, position was. And by using a bunch of math, we can take in these more frequent inertial measurements and propagate the actual error associated with it. So you get a good estimate of where you are, but it gets noisier and noisier, and then the optical system pushes you back to where you really are. And that's, for the purposes of, of this discussion, all we really need to think about is optical system gets, you know, fixes up the drift in the IMU periodically. Okay, so the real secret to Lighthouse, the basic thing that it does that makes it do everything that it does is that we turn the problem of measuring at some kind of bearing angle into a measuring of time problem. So in order to do that, we need to know some time, some reference time that this was pointing in some known direction. And then we can measure the time be between when it was at that location and when it passes by our sensor. So in the you know, little diagram that we've got here, these square pulses are some kind of synchronization system. A you know, flash bulb goes off and says, start your clock now. And then when the beam sweeps across you, you see you know, a kind of a peak. And this red time divided by, or well, actually this time here divided by this time, gives you the angle. Pretty straightforward. You can get your answer to very high resolution as long as you can measure time accurately. So base stations obviously live in, in a bunch of other you know, light. There's all kinds of modulated light from, you know, different things out in the world, remote controls in particular, you know, they send out, you know, buzzy kind of high-powered pulses of light. Then you have DC sources of light, like the sun. The base station has a high-frequency modulation on the light that it emits so that the sensors on the tracked object can reject all of that other noise and only see the signals that they care about. Okay, let's have a look inside a, a real base station. This is by no means the only way that you can implement a base station, but it's how the current generation works. So we've got these structures here. We call them pretty unimaginably rotors. They're uh, a, basically a mirror and a, a lens system, which produces that swept beam of light. Also, we have these synchronization pulse emitters that produce a flash every time the rotor is at a specific angle. Now, so it goes flash, sweep, flash, sweep. We have two rotors mounted orthogonally, so you get two measurements in, uh, you know, 90 degrees apart from each other. I shouldn't really think about them as, as X and Y because, you know, the, the base station can be oriented anyway, but it projects a field of light into the world that allows you to determine two bearing angles from the base station, basically, you know, an elevation and an, an azimuth. These pulses, though they look here to be all the same length, they're not. They're, they're modulated in length that sends information about the identity of the base station, which particular rotor that flash was associated with, and also um, calibration information. When you build a base station, it's hard to build it perfectly, so we calibrate each one to correct for its non-idealities. Those, um, they might be like the physical you know, alignment of all the bits and pieces inside the base station. Additionally, um, we, we call that data stream UTIX, uh, which means omnidirectional optical transmission, although it's not very omnidirectional, it's most definitely optical. It came from a time when the base stations were quite a little bit different. Ah, more, more sound? Yes. Is that better? Okay. What? <laughs> uh, okay. The, um, the field of view of this system is about 120 degrees, so the fan beams are 120 degrees and they sweep through 120 degrees. Again, that's not the only way that you can implement a base. It just happens to be the way that the current generation is implemented. So now to the resolution requirement. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. You know, it's something you could build out of junk at home. And you can actually build a pretty, pretty bad base station out of junk in your, in your lab at home. But for the VR, it's a little bit more challenging. Say we want about five meters of, of range. So, so the user has the ability to walk around in a reasonable volume, but you know, the size of this stage may be a little bigger. So, how much spatial resolution do we need within that volume? 
It actually varies. Um, Let's just say we need one millimeter to make it easy. So right out at five meters, we need one millimeter of resolution from the system. That, uh, that means that basically you need to be able to measure, because it's an angular system, at least 200 microradians of resolution, which is, uh, is, is pretty small. To, to give you a sort of an intuitive idea of this, a, a sheet of typing paper like this is about 100 microns thick. So if you hold that half a meter away, like arm's length, that will subtend, edge on, an angle of about 200 microradians. So if you project that out five, um, well, 10 times farther, it'll be 10 times wider, and that'll be about a millimeter. And it turns out that, that that's good for spatial. So obviously, if I'm, if I'm pointing out into the world, I can resolve one millimeter spatially right out at the sphere of the surface out at five meters. But I also need to care about range. So range has a, what I call the skinny triangle problem. So as it's drawn here, all angle measuring systems basically work out how far away something is by the angular size that it subtends at the base. So you, know, you have two measurements of two sensors, the angle that you see, and you know how far apart this is, you can work it out, basic triangulation. But the farther you go out, the, you know, the flatter these two rays become, and there's much less angle measurement between them. So any noise associated with this angle, this, this distance, directly turns into range noise, and the effect gets worse and worse with range. It gets worse like the square of range. So for something about the size of your head, which is what you know, a head-mounted display would be, you, you only have so much opportunity to have a baseline that you can measure upon, and that means you probably need about 50 microradians of resolution, so about four or five times better than that to even have a hope of being in the right ballpark. Now, also, we want to track things about the size of your fist, like controllers, and perhaps even smaller objects. So really, we just want as much resolution as we can, but let's go with 50 microradians. So 50 microradians is about eight parts per million of two pi. So of a whole circle, about eight parts per million. Parts per million is, is a very useful way of talking about resolution of things. Um, I use it all the time, but I thought I had to have a slide on it because it's not maybe that used that commonly. So one part per million is simply, it's a kind of like percentage. It's a unitless measurement that means parts of something over the whole of something, and you know, there's one millionth of it is, is one part per million. Its uh, percentage would be 100, parts per million, it's a million. In the, in the case of the digital world, if you wanted to keep halving something down to one part per million, you'd have to do that 20 times. So there's 20 bits of information required to encode one part per million resolution of something. And uh, another way of thinking about it is that over, that over the span of an entire year, about uh, 31 seconds is about one part per million, or probably about as long as I took to explain this. Also, uh, another way to think about it, this projector is probably like a thousand by a thousand here, so it's got a million pixels on the screen, so one pixel element is about one part per million. Okay, so do we have enough timing resolution? Obviously, to measure, we want to measure down to, say, eight. Well, let's go 10 parts per million, make the math a little easier. We, need to, we have a way to translate our angle problem into the time domain, so it all comes down to time resolution. In, uh, in the system, we already have a 48 megahertz clock, conveniently, because we have USB in the system, so we can take our 48 megahertz signal. A 48 meg signal has a period of about 20.9 nanoseconds. We call that one tick, and everything is kind of based on this one tick concept. We're going to spin it at 60 times a second. We'll talk more about that later. Um, that's 16.7 milliseconds, so 800,000 ticks all the way around. We can resolve down to about 1.25 parts per million. So we, we've got the temporal resolution, so it seems like uh, we're good to go. Let's talk about the mechanical system. So obviously, we're scanning something physically with a motor. We're spinning something around, and it has to basically spin at a constant rate. I mean, where the assumption is that it took, you know, Amiga is exactly constant in this system. If we want to um, do that, we obviously have to control this mechanical system extremely well, probably, you know, more closely than many other mechanical oscillators have ever been controlled before. And this was one of our big problems. Probably the, the only practical way to know where something is to this kind of resolution is to use light. So we put a, uh, a reflective sensor, we use an optical retroreflective sensor to, to measure an exact place on the rotor as it rotates. The, uh, the exact phase angle of this doesn't matter so much, we can calibrate that out, but the really important thing is that whatever 
signal we get out of this gives us a nice sharp edge that we can use to say the rotor is exactly here. Now our rotor is about 30 millimetres in diameter, a bit over an inch. That's just, well we'll talk more about why it ends up about that size, but um, let's, we'll say it's about an inch. So around the circumference here, we have to measure, you know, down to basically, if we want to use all of our clock resolution, 1.25 parts per million, we want to be able to measure space down to 1.25 parts per million. And that ends up that we're talking about 90, 94 nanometers. So not, we need to resolve 94 nanometers of actual circumference. That seems pretty impractical, right? Like, it, it seems utterly crazy that you could do that. But it turns out that uh, it's not. But it is technically challenging. So as this rotates into view of the sensor, we get a very slow kind of transition. And this is the worst thing that you want to see if you're ever going to make a decision, because when you zoom in on it, you know, you've got all this noise, and when you, even with hysteresis, this can be a big problem. But surprisingly, this system actually works, and, and it re, it's limited by our, our temporal resolution, not so much by you know, the, any of the, the engineering problems about doing it. And that was a big surprise to me. I still don't know how it manages to resolve down to, you know, basically the level of nanometers, because, tens of nanometers, because this light emitting here is 850 nanometers. So we're measuring about one-seventh of the wavelength. Pretty crazy stuff. Okay, so we have a way to know where the motor is. We have to have some kind of feedback loop that keeps the motor spinning at that constant rate that we desire. The, uh, the actual position, repeatability, when we're talking about, it comes down to over the, you know, the 16.7 milliseconds that it takes to go around, it will come back to the same position to within about 2,500 atoms, which is just insane when you think about it. And this is just with a piece of aluminium you know, tape stuck to some plastic on top of a motor, although these motors are pretty special stuff. We started off with ball bearing motors, and we had lots of problems with ball bearing motors. They have mechanical problems, they have run out problems, they're noisy. Uh, we ended up going via sleeve bearing motors and a bunch of other motors, and we ended up with fluid dynamic bearing motors, which is what the current tech that's used in hard drives. They just have far better performance, and they're exactly what we needed, although they still have their limitations. The uh, motor control system, I won't go into the details of. It, again, could take a day to talk about. But the, uh, the key thing is that it, it knows exactly where the rotor is at every, at, you know, all the time, and it's responsible for turning off the lasers whenever the thing is out of spec. So if you pick up a base station or you bump it, or when the thing's spinning up to speed, it won't allow you to broadcast bad information out into the world. OK, so why do we spin at 60 hertz? Seems like we could spin slower, we'd get more value out of, you know, we'd get more resolution, we could run our clocks slower, everything would just be better. But the surprising answer turns out to be due to gravity, of all things. So we already see that gravity makes the, you know, we can't just grow the rotors to huge big chunks of tungsten, which would be ideal, right? You could have huge, huge amounts of inertia and the thing would be much more stable. But if we do that, if the person drops it from two metres, the thing's going to smash, right? And its own weight will be ridiculous. But gravity also causes problems for the inertial fusion system that we were talking about earlier. The big thing about gravity is that it's this enormous vector. You know, when you're moving around you know, in human kind of scales, that's a very, very tiny acceleration. So the accelerometer is getting you basically this noise around this massive DC gravity vector. And if you get the orientation of that vector even slightly wrong, there's some kind of resultant, and that resultant, when you integrate it, will just make your object fly off into space. So you need to keep correcting that drift at a high enough rate. It turns out that about 60 hertz works out to be about right for the kinds of systems we're talking about and the kind of resolution that we're talking about in, in the volume of a room. Okay, so that's the mechanical scanning part of it. Let's talk about the light emitting part of it. Out at five meters, again, we've got 120 degree field of view, so we, we have approximately, you know, kind of a, a frustum shaped thing, but it, it's more curved. Um, we've got about 10.5 metres by 10.5 metres to cover. The laser beam itself is super thin. It, it's a sheet of light. It's about 4 millimetres wide, and the, the total surface area is pretty small. So we don't need anywhere near as much power in the laser beam as we do in that omnidirectional sync signal that's sent out to the rest of the volume. It turns out that you need about 2,800 times more power, or there's 2,800 times more area to cover for the sync signal than there is for the laser signal. So if you can think about it this way, this this area follows the inverse square law. So you, you know, every time you double the distance, you're going to need four times the power. 
this pretty close to approximately b is linear because it's really just expanding in the in the fan angle direction it's not expanding in the you know the other spatial direction very much at all there is a bit of divergence but it's pretty close to being perfectly linear that doesn't give us any absolute values but it says that whatever it is the sink is going to be a much more challenging problem in terms of power okay so let's talk about sensor sensitivity <coughs> Um, sensors are basically little solar cells. Like we use the BPW-34 diode, which is you know, off the shelf. It's about uh, 7.5 square millimetres of silicon. It's about, that makes about 2.7 something millimetres. It's not, it's rectangular, it's not a circle, but it's about three millimetres in radius. If we put that out in the sun, typical silicon photodiode, it'll put out about 0.6, 0 0.7 0 volts open circuit, and a short circuit current would be about 4 milliamps. So sunlight is about 1,000 watts per square meter. So 1,000 watts per square meter is not as insane as it sounds when you're talking about lasers. I mean, this dot is very bright, and it's probably much brighter than sunlight on the same surface. So we can work backwards through how much power we'd need. We know that this is you know, 0.04 square meters, 5 meters away, and we end up with an input power requirement of 40 watts. So 40 watts, I mean, there's laser cutters that use less power than that, right? That, that's a ridiculous amount of power. Plus, even though this is being swept around and it's fanned, there's no way you're going to get that past eye safety. That'll burn your eyes out if you look at it. Um, <laughs> so clearly, this is just not going to happen. So we need a sensor with some gain. We can put, we reduce the power input, say, down to 40 milliwatts, which is still high. I mean, this laser pointer is about twice that power but it's still pretty high value. It certainly wouldn't be directed into your eye very good for you, but spread out, it's perfectly safe. Out here, basically we're taking everything down by 1,000. So out here, we've got one watt per square meter. This means that out of our sensor, we get about four microamps. Four microamps, you know, it's, it's a reasonably big value. It's, it's, it's small, we can, but what we also need to worry about is other losses in the system. So we have losses through our optics, we, this sensor might not be oriented directly you know, in the optimal direction for picking up all the light. It could be tilted off. In most cases, we can go about 60 degrees off in both directions, so we need to deal with that. Also, sync is clearly still going to be a challenge. It's not going to be technically very easy to put out one watt per square metre out at you know, the 110 square metres of, of area out there. So I've just chucked in an attenuator here to say, all right, we're going to get something on the order of hundreds of nanoamps into the front end of our amplifier. So we had some transimpedance, and we have some gain, and we have some signal processing, and we output an LVTTL signal. So this has a huge amount of gain. It's probably on the order of you know, 120 dB, but there's some conversions between power and there's some saturation going on. So you've got 100 nanoamps kind of region going in here, and out here you're swinging you know, 3 volts at least at fairly large amounts of current charging the capacitance of the line driving back to the microcontroller. And this is all done at baseband. There's no envelope detection going on here, potentially. I mean, there is in the current system, but that's a pretty challenging problem and a recipe for oscillation any day. This took us, uh, the sensor is one of the most challenging technical parts of the system to get right. And uh, my little implementation, which you may have seen, I've posted the, the circuit diagram of an equivalent kind of sensor, uh, works pretty well. But when we went to try and convert this into discrete silicon, the ASIC guys had a great deal of difficulty duplicating that same performance. Okay, so back to sync. We know that we're putting 40 milliwatts into this little stripe of light. That means we need 110 watts to cover this entire area. So like a light bulb, you know, an old fashioned incandescent light bulb, but in that case, that'd be even less efficient than that. So that's a lot of power. I don't think anyone, even though this sync flash is fairly low duty cycle, no one's gonna wanna put that kind of power into their base station. Realistically, we arrive at about 50 watts. So the peak power of our sync blinker, it's around about 50 watts. The duty cycle is what, probably less than 3%, so about half the power that's going into the base station is just charging up caps to blast out that big flash of light. Okay, there's other constraints with the sensor system. This beam is actually moving pretty darn quick. When you're out at five meters, it's going 1,900 meters per second, or about five and a half times the speed of sound. It actually exceeds the speed of sound once you're about a meter out from the base station. So it sweeps past your sensor really, really quickly. I mean, this is you know, about three millimeters wide. If you do the math, that works out to be about 1.6 microseconds of exposure. Now we know that there's a HF modulation going on to, to, you know, to allow us to reject ambient light. 
So there just isn't that much time for you to see those modulations as the beam sweeps past. Also, you've got to war worry about the envelope itself. Like Even ignoring the modulation, the sensor has to have enough bandwidth to pass all of this information. And doing that cheaply is challenging. Plus, the photodiode has a capacitance of about 30 picofarad. So you have to terminate it in a fairly low impedance or bootstrap away that capacitance so that you can even have a hope of detecting this tiny, tiny signal down in the you know, hundreds of nanoamps. This took us, again, quite a long time to get this to work. And obviously, the future is probably more about more modulations and higher speed, higher performance sensors. OK, let's talk more about all the stuff that didn't work. I mentioned ball bearing motors. Ball bearing motors, uh, you know, they're, they're physically kind of complicated. You've got all these little balls running around in races. If the balls have any kind of defects, the, they'll hop around and, you know, they'll jump and, be, and make mechanical glitches. So basically, the friction of the system changes. So if you were driving it at a constant you know, current and suddenly the friction changes, everything will slow down. You'll get these glitches. So that was a big problem, and I've got some horrifying graphs later about how difficult that actually was to get to work. Mechanical noise is an issue as well. I mean, these things are going to be put in people's houses. They need to be fairly quiet. Non-repeated runout is a term that, that's used particularly in the hard drive industry. So runout is basically when the, the rotor that wobbles around in, inside its bearings. Non-repeated runout is where that's not predictable. In, in the hard drive industry, what they do is they, uh, they basically take the Fourier transform of the position and they continuously compensate for it. So as long as it's constant, they can do that. So it doesn't matter if things you know, are centric and it's wobbling around like this. They, they know that it's wobbling. But if the thing's randomly wobbling as well, that's really bad for them. Fortunately, that's a very similar application to us because we're putting a laser beam on it and projecting it out into the world. So if it's wobbling around, that would be bad for us as well. So we could take hard drive level technology and fortunately we got Nedec, probably the, the best company on the planet for making motors, to make us a motor that's similar to a hard drive motor, um, a little bit cheaper, but uh, has the performance in the range that we need. So we looked at sleeve bearing motors. They're obviously much cheaper. You know, it's just a, a sheet of piece of metal basically with a hole drilled in it or they've been impregnated with metal with uh, grease. The problem with these is no one would certify the lifetime. They, no one would say, we wanted these things to run for five years continuously. I mean, whenever you talk about a mechanical system, people come to you and say, OK, so you've, you've built this thing, but it's got spinning parts in it. It'll die in a month. Well, no. We wanted these things to last at least five years. And we, we can actually do a lot better than that. But with sleeve bearing motors, no one would do that. Sleeve bearing motors also have this problem with end float. Most of them are built that they don't have any kind of biasing in their bearings. So the bearing can float up and down axially. And that screws with our calibration because it changes the geometry between the laser emitter and the, the optics that are spinning in that rotor. Okay, so also, even when it all works, you start, you know, you get stuff like this, where this is sub microsecond kind of spin to spin variance, millions of times. You know, this looks like this base station is doing really well. But then if you look at it in other domains, you find that it's not. So this is jitter, and this is time in hours. It's most of the time, you know, it's down around five parts per million. That's fantastic. That's exactly what we want, twice what we need. But then other times, something just totally goes wrong. This took a bunch of time to work out. Nedek helped us with it. Um, but it, it turns out to be uh, something we don't completely understand, but it really has to do with the modes. The, in a fluid dynamic bearing motor, the, the, the pressure is generated by the rotation. Basically, the entire rotor floats inside the fluid. And you can get some weird moding effects, particularly if there's some interaction with your driver. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff in making Lighthouse work was just developing metrology where you can measure down to these tiny, tiny things to even see what's going on. Reality is that a lot of the, the rotational jitter cancels, because what you can do is you can measure the start and end of the entire spin. So if there's a small amount of acceleration in that, you can fit it to a model and correct for part of it. But it's still not ideal. It's still noise that you want to get rid of. This is more like what a sleeve bearing motor might look like. So some of them are okay, and some of them just come from the factory completely crap, and you can't build devices with this. So, I mean, you can, but their performance is just gonna be random. So other stuff that was super challenging and mostly doesn't work. Laser line lenses off eBay. We started you know, building all this stuff with junk off eBay, and you can make, again, a, a pretty bad base station using that, but it's very hard to make a good one. 
Generally, they have horrible quality, even if you get one from a reputable manufacturer, because most people only care about making pretty lines for you know, a saw or something like that. They're not trying to do metrology level measurements with them. They have limited availability even. We, we, we had one manufacturer who had you know, a, a 20 cavity mold for making these lenses. And only one of the cavities in that mold still worked. All of the other ones were completely destroyed. They'd been, either they never worked properly to start with or they'd just been worn out. This tool had been running since like the 90s or something crazy. And we were about to make thousands of these things and hundreds of thousands of these things. So clearly we can't rely on that manufacturer. Um, uh, most of them are also tuned for operation invisible light, either red or green. When you use them at infrared, even though it's a longer wavelength, that can be surprisingly tricky. Another problem, cheap laser diodes. You, you, you get complete rubbish out there from, from people on, uh, even high quality manufacturers, sometimes they get a bad batch of laser diodes in the actual device. So one guy in the audience I know here um, <laughs> tested a bunch of motors for us. My girlfriend had to test a bunch of laser diodes. So it's, uh, this is not very feasible when you're scaling up to, to large uh, manufacturing. The uh, lifetime we found in one particular ones was completely random. Like most things, you have like a bathtub curve kind of thing going on. Early, you have early failures, then you have wear out. Same kind of thing applies to, to laser diodes with um, the extra complication that laser diodes lifetime basically gets halved for every 10 degrees C the thing operates at. So keeping the thing cool, controlling the amount of power that it's actually trying to put out and, and actually getting real power, not you know, marketing power out of laser diodes can be really tricky. So this is why lenses matter. This is a, this is a nice red line. I mean, it looks okay. There's a little bit of you know, noise here, it's a bit of a spatial pattern that's, that's a diffractive artifact. And this is the same lens illuminated with a really bad infrared laser. So you know, these are centimeters. <laughs> and that's, uh, you're not going to use that to, this is five meters away, though, I'll admit. But uh, yeah, not great. Although even though it's being swept, some of that um, actually, you can sort of ignore, but it's not great because if you're a sensor and you're moving you know, through the beam in this direction, your idea of position is going to vary quite a lot. So this is a fan lens, um, like you might get off eBay. This one is a sample that I got from a manufacturer telling me they could make a lot of these things. You know, it looks beautiful, clean. There's just this little bit of degating here, but that's fine. You don't care about that part of the lens. So you, I ordered you know, 10,000 of these things. I wanted to make a whole bunch of base stations. And then they arrived looking like this. So instead of being in trays or any kind of you know, reputable way to ship something, they basically sent them to me in a plastic bag, like 10,000 of these things floating around, scratching each other. These are uh, like red and white fibers. It was just a mess. And I went through a number of different manufacturers to try and find a lens. Eventually, I gave up because stuff like this was happening. Um, I got a more reputable manufacturer that sent me lenses in trays, and those lenses arrived. This was all the one skew. They were all meant to be the same. Well, these, these two lasers fit into each These two um, lenses fit into each other, so clearly they're not. One is like the mirror of the other. I, I have no idea how this happened, but there was actually three different kinds of lenses in that batch. So again, eventually we gave up and just started making our own and we can do a lot better than than any existing lens out there but it took us quite a while to get there so here's the open problems i mean i've said a lot about you know how we killed this well there's still uh, there's a lot of problems that we haven't killed yet optical sync is a big one obviously you know we that's a huge amount of power and it's probably the biggest limitation in the system for how far we can reach in range, um, and it also takes up a lot of time in, in angle space. It's generally annoying, and we're looking at ways of replacing that. It'd be nice to do low sensor, tra low sensor count tracking modes, particularly for objects that have you know, a lower quality of service demand. Um, it'd be good if we had better sensor FOVs. Our current uh, photodiodes are basically our little flat planar things. Covering them up to make a nice industrial design in your product is, is a bit of a challenge as well. Um, solid state scanning is obviously everyone wants a base station without moving parts. It turns out that half of the magic comes from the fact that we are mo using moving parts and we get a lot of the physics for free. But MEMS and electro-optical effects clearly may be one way you can make a base station. Um, Lighthouse actually came from an, a, a, a development on an earlier idea that I had, which was a spatial coding system much like Lighthouse, but it, pr it transmitted everything in parallel using a DLP projector. The problem was it didn't have enough resolution, so my solution was to you know, shake the projector or eventually just sweep the entire thing and, and just deal with the fact that you're only getting one update per spin. 
you could obviously, the idea of Lighthouse in itself is more than just the way that it's implemented. It's really about using time to resolve angle or to work out where you are. It's not like GPS in the sense that GPS uses distances, so it's a, it's a multilaterating system instead of a triangulating system. But you could also do that. You can obviously phase modulate the transmission and use that to give you a distance measuring effect if you can synchronize your clocks well enough. Uh, one interesting thing about that is uh, if lighthouses like, um, you may have heard of VOR in, used in um, navigation with aircraft, then that would add the DME capability, distance measuring ability, to lighthouse. So, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of interesting challenges here, a lot of work to, to keep going on with. Um, right now, people can get ASICs off the shelf. Our partner, Triad Semiconductor, makes an ASIC sensor. You can get it on a little breakout board that's easy and hacker-friendly. Um, so HTC is currently selling the base stations um, individually, and they also sell um, our controller and, you know, and obviously the, the entire system if you wanted a VR system as well. So right now it's, it's quite simple for people to go and buy the bits and pieces of this technology and start using it in their own applications. And we encourage you to do that. Okay, so question time. <laughs>